Good afternoon. Uh, I'd first like to say many thanks to SOAS for inviting me to participate in this event. I've actually known Duncan for a very long time. The first time he met me, I was almost barely still a schoolgirl, and that was in 1988 in the um, Hilton Fontainebleau Hotel at the ALS conference. I bet you don't remember it, Duncan, but I was wide-eyed and bushy-tailed to meet all of these critical legal studies people. And, of course, they didn't know me from Adam, and they were all very cliquey and unfriendly. And I was at this critical legal studies party, standing around like a wallflower, and Duncan hones into on me. And then for the really for the rest of that party, and this is one of the things I really like about Duncan, he is so unhierarchical. Whoever is the lowest on the totem pole, he homes right in on them and makes them feel important. And I remember that moment because I was incredibly disappointed. Uh, I was all geared up to meet Duncan Kennedy, the great white male guru. I was very fierce in my feminism those days, and I was predisposed to absolutely dislike him. And I was, from the moment I met him, completely won over and have been ever since. So when I received this invitation, it, I was thrilled, uh, thrilled to be able to come here and celebrate the scholarship of Duncan Kennedy. So, moving on to what I'm going to talk about, I've been asked to talk about the relationship between feminism and critical legal studies. And I have to say, I think from the point of view of how feminists engage in law, I'm not one of these feminists that think there's a particularly distinct brand or view that um, characterises a feminist position. So I see feminist engagements in law as in many ways an exemplar of other kinds of engagements. Uh, another thing I think is really interesting is when Duncan talked about seeing law as, as an object, an object of love, as Costa said, I really identified with that because I think in many ways um, my engagements with feminism and law are as much about my love of law as they are about my love of feminism. Although I do think there's a problem with presenting that as an object because I think one of the most distinct things about what Duncan does is that he presents law not as a text, although it involves working with texts, but he presents law as a doing. It's an action. It's something that one does. In particular, in his accounts of legal reasoning, he talks about uh, doing law as a form of strategic interpretation. And that's what I want to talk about today, because that, in my scholarship, in my feminist scholarship, more than anything, I have been influenced by the work of Duncan and other critical legal scholars, for example, Carl Clare, Francis Olson, uh, to look at law as a site for the strategic interpretation of the legal materials for progressive legal ends. And I'm, like Duncan, I'm going to do this by giving you a concrete example. And I think it's one that will be um, close to the heart of certainly many of the women in the room. And it involves um, a recent judgment in the High Court uh, given by Mr. Judge Green. And the case was DSD and MBV versus Commissioner for the Metropolitan Police. And the background of the case is the terrible tale of John Warboys, the black cab rapist. Now, as most of us in this room will know, during the first decade of the 21st century, John Warboys, in his guise as benevolent black cabbie, picked up young and often vulnerable women from nightclubs and other events and um, raped and or assaulted them, a drug-assisted um, assault, in his black cab. It was estimated that during uh, the 2002-2008 period, certainly from the number of complaints that have since been received, he sexually assaulted over 100 in w women. In fact, 105 complaints were received. And uh, during that period, the police consistently... Th th well, it's just an absolute litany of incompetence, bias... Um, complicity is an appalling tale of how badly these victims were treated, how little was done to secure evidence, um, to uh, follow up with witnesses, to just take the basic procedures that one has to take to build a case. Eventually, 
as part of a random routine computer operation, they picked up some connections between different reports by women, and suddenly um, they acted. And John Warboys was arrested very, very quickly in 2008, not long after the Daily Mirror um, broke the story. So the story broke, and the Metropolitan Police had to act very quickly. And to cut a long story very, very short, he was arrested. He was convicted on 20 uh, counts, 19 of a sexual assault and one of rape, and uh, got his dues. Okay? And... The interesting thing about all of this is those of us who have been campaigning to improve the criminal justice approach to rape um, have been doing so for an awful long time. And every time we talk to the police, we are told that it's all done. The policies are in place, the guidance is there, the training has been done, no worries. And yet time and time again, when studies are um, undertaken, they reveal huge police failings when it comes to the management and conduct and disposition of rape allegations. And these studies have now built up into a huge body of statistical data that a lot of pundits spend a lot of time flipping and flicking and arguing about. Because let's face it, data is just data. It's just numbers. What's amazing about this case, and it is 120 pages, this case, by Mr. Justice Green, is that he spends 70 of those pages with a step-by-step, -step, detailed factual account of everything that went wrong. It makes horrific reading. But apart from anything else, whether or not it'll, it will survive the scrutiny of appeal, uh, it is now a public record which tells you more about how the police handle rape complaints than any of those studies, any of that da data, any of those statistics. It's an incredible read. So that in itself tells you something about strategic engagement of law, that it can get this kind of issue out there into a public forum, telling a story, telling two women's stories individually and in great detail, and the sort of incredible political power that has. But let's move back to how all this relates to Duncan Kennedy. So these two women sued the police. Now, any of you who are tort lawyers know that when you try and sue the police, for um, not investigating a crime properly, the courts are going to come down on you and hard and say, you can't sue in negligence, there is an immunity in tort, it's uh, against public policy, it in in encourages defect, um, a defense of policing, blah, blah, blah. It's all being but cut down and shut down by recent case law, particularly the Smith and Van Call cases at um, the end of 2010. So, again, applying Duncan Kennedy's approach, if one were to look at this, as I would, um, at one's immediate anticipation on hearing that this claim had been launched was, oh boy, that's going to fail. They're just going to be thrown out of court again. And then you start to think, and this is where I'm drawing on your paper called A Left Phenomenological Alternative to Hart and Kelson. No, no, I'm not. I'm drawing on freedom and constraint and adjudication. Sorry, I'll get to Hart and Kelson. Um, and then you start to think, how could I make this come out the way I want it? Anyway, uh, and that is what Judge Green does. Judge Green is no Oxbridge clone. Judge Green got his LLB from Leicester Law School. He is a well-known um, he's a well-known uh, human rights uh, barrister who only in November got appointed to the um, uh, judiciary, and by February he's producing this 120-page judgment, which may or may not survive appeal. And when one reads this, it is clear from the very first line how he wants it to come out completely clear, and it is a brilliant example of working the raw materials in order to get an answer. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the case, and this is where I do move on to um, Duncan Kennedy's Hart and Kelson and the phenomenological alternatives, okay, is if you frame this as a tort problem, uh, five minutes, if you frame this as a tort problem, then you're in very, very troubled waters. 
because there's a lot of case law and it goes all over the place and it's very conflicting, but generally negative. What does Judge Green do? In the very first paragraph, he says, this is not a tort claim. There's no tort arguments going to be made here. The tort avenue is closed. He shuts it off, closes the door, pushes away. But you know what's so lovely about what he does? He doesn't just shut the tort law away. He shuts away all the policy arguments, all the policy objections to liability um, imposed on the place. So he says, this is what he calls, this is a settled area of law which we cannot revisit. This is what Duncan calls free, um, identifying the core and the penumbra. So he says, here's a core. We can't do anything about this. Let's look at this other bit. And the other bit, of course, is the claim under um, Article 3 that the police have violated uh, these women's right to um, be protected from inhum inhuman and degrading treatment. And uh, Judge Green then does another sort of flipping of cores and penumbrae. Because what he does is he says, well, nobody's really looked at the Strasbourg jurisprudence of this. Uh, I haven't found any articles or any useful synthesis of the case law, so I'm going to do it myself. So he spends 40 pages synthesizing the case law in such a way as to make sure that by the time you get to the end of it, you couldn't even begin to question the idea that there isn't a positive duty on the police to investigate crime where a failure to do so might violate someone's Article 2 or Article 3 rights. Now, it's brilliant the way he does it because what he does is basically take an area of huge uncertainty and he says it's totally settled, mature law. It's so settled and so mature that I have no um, alternative under my obligations in the Human Rights Act than to apply it. Yeah, and you know what else that makes them do? The defendants are over here kind of going, hello, hello, we've got a few arguments here. Okay, but because he said the law is so settled, he disposes of their arguments almost, almost briefly, briefly and, and, and without uh, any particular consideration, because again, it's how he frames it. They're trying to make an argument that the duty only arises when the police have actually been complicit in inflicting the harm, the Article 3 harm. For example, a death or injury in custody. And that the duty doesn't arise when you have uh, an independent third party doing the harming. But he sets up, Green sets up the whole legal case law around independent third parties and cuts out the whole police complicity thing, says, I'm not looking at that, that's not relevant, and therefore he never actually needs to deal with our argument. He simply points to the bits of the case law that support him. So, let me sum up on this. In traditional jurisprudence, Hart, Kelson, McCormick and Co. all argue that there is a core of settled law and there's a penumbra of uncertainty and a lot of the debate in jurisprudence and in the classroom and in the courts has been about how big or wide or, uh, this penumbra is, okay, and where the lines are. And one of the best things that Duncan Kennedy ever did, okay, and has done many things, is quite rightly point out that there isn't a core of settled law and a penumbra of uncertain boundaries because the whole business of identifying what's in the core and identifying what's in the boundary or in the penumbra, constructing the, the core penumbra boundary is itself part of the business of working the legal materials. So that even an area which is completely settled can be unsettled by shifting it out of the core and into the penumbra. And an area which looks really unsettled and not um, indeterminate can be settled by the um, progressive judge by shifting it into the core. That's what Judge Green does. I recommend you read the case because it is worth the 120 pages, but in any event, I'm sure that somewhere in his undergraduate LLB in the University of Leicester, he read a left alternative, phenomenological alternative to Hart and Kelson. Thank you.
panellist is Rav Zreik, who is Assistant Professor at the Carmel Academic Centre and Co-Academic Director of the Minerva Centre for the Humanities at Tel Aviv University, Critical Legal Studies and Postmodernism. Yes, I promised this title, but I never promised to keep my, uh, my word. Um, yes, uh, I probably... This is uh, the subtitle, the first title probably, Duncan in Tahrir Square. Okay. Um, uh, actually, uh, during Tahrir Square, I was thinking uh, how Duncan would, on the one hand, um, sharing the, uh, the demonstrations and uh, doing pamphlets, and very enthusiastic, and on the other hand, uh, uh, during the night, cooling his enthusiasm with his cynicism that it might work, it might not work. So on both sides, either his passion will win or his intellect will win. And this is ironic distancing would allow him to celebrate, uh, to celebrate the both sides of the divide of the self between the intellect and uh, the passion. But those who want to have it all might not have anything um, out of all. Uh, and this is a beginning because I think that most of the work of uh, postmodern uh, theory is obsessed with the, with the question of the openness of the intellect on the one hand and the closure of the political. The political is the moment of action. When you do action, you exclude other actions. You just commit because it's a moment of violence because it's a moment that <coughs> uh, finality. Uh, while the intellectual needs to keep uh, something uh, open. It's the fear of, uh, of error. And this is something that uh, uh, obsessed me uh, a lot. And uh, as a leftist and as a post-Marxist, uh, uh, obsessed me uh, a lot, as uh, reading the work of Duncan is interesting uh, in this part. What I'm going uh, to do is the impossible, which is uh, saying something about legal interpretation in Duncan seeing how this goes up critique, the viral critique to politics, and then uh, the resistant of reconstructive projects, third. This is the third uh, move, and I would, my main emphasis would be on the third move, uh, actually. So thanks, uh, I do think that freedom, or freedom and uh, constraint in education is just marvelous, Peace, not only, and this is my argument, not only for legal theory, but as one of the most sophisticated pieces in, in, in postmodern uh, literature, if we may call it a postmodern uh, literature. Uh, I'm not gonna, those who are not acquainted, I'm ready for the question and answer uh, with the piece, say something uh, uh, about it. Uh, but I would, I would read the two pieces. Duncan says, put together, present the experience of legal reasoning as an activity pursued in a medium that is at once plastic and resistant. They do not aim to show that legal reasoning is always indeterminate. There has never been such an argument that it's always indeterminate. So politics is within the material themselves. They're not from without. So it's not that politics enter. It's already been there. Now, ideology is not irrelevant and not the thing that gives closure at the same time. So it's relevant, but it doesn't give closure. And it's not only politics all the way down, the emphasis on only politics. Politics is everywhere, but it's not never alone. There is always a gravitational uh, field within which politics work. So it's politics all the way down, it's law all the way up, and it's all we are thrown in a situation where politics and law and normativity come together. Now, I want to say as a proposal for further research, one about decisionism, second about power knowledge, three about separation of field, and three anti-foundational theory. One, there is a residue or resonance of Schmidt decisionism, but this is not Schmidt decisionism nor Derrida decisionism, because the reading, the nuanced piece, would tell you that it's not like the moment that, like Poffendorf or Kierkegaard even, or Schmidt, where the image of the decision is above an normative field. I mean, all the decisionism is, starts as a, in political theology, whether God, when he proclaims his law, 
is acting outside of a gravitational field. The decision made is not out of the gravitational field, though it's not decided by the gravitational field. And I think this is a more nuanced vision of how decision is being made. It's decisionism, but not on the image of God making decision, nor the sovereign absolutely stands up above norms. Second, Foucault power knowledge. I found so much um, homology between uh, power knowledge and law politics in Duncan. It's always a mistake to read Foucault. It's all the way down power. It's not all the way down power. And the category of knowledge is not parasitic on power. If, if it's parasitic, we don't need the two categories. It's they are mutually constitutive. And it's interesting to see the parallels between these two uh, 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 arguments. Three, the impossibility of separation of the field. Duncan never says it's impossible to separate the fields. He said we don't have any scientific ground when we make any argument of where the line between science and non-science is drawn. There is no scientific ground where private and public are drawn. There is no non-partisan way where law and politics. There are always a line, but we never know where the line is, only ex post facto, as if time comes from the future. In this sense, the judge, the <coughs> judge, the image of the judge that makes decisions is actually the image of all of us making decision every day. In this sense, if we think that judges all the time making hard cases and all of us are sort of judges and we are not Hercules, then in a way, the image of the judge become not only the center of legal theory, but the center of the human predicament as thrown in a situation where materials sort of run out and we have to resort to sort of ethics of responsibility and we can't lean on anything back. Now, Duncan doesn't propose a counter theory or anti-foundational theory in this sense. He just leave us without theory. There's a difference between the two. He leave us with experience, the experience of the judge that goes to that point and, and he leave us there. The second move is the, so this is about legal theory and how this spreads. The second move is the sort of the move from this indeterminacy, if we can call it indeterminacy, and it moves up <coughs> to ideology, politics, philosophy. The same openness, plasticity, and restraint, it's always plasticity and restraint, freedom and restraint that we experience within the legal materials, we experience when we go out from the legal materials to other categories like philosophy, etc. Now, this move, it's not free from, uh, uh, um, from some, some, some problems, but I, I would leave that aside, but I would focus on what comes out from assuming that it's, uh, uh, it's a, the right move uh, to do, what comes out, what are the consequences of such move? If the structure has no center that structures the structure, so if capitalism has no sort of heart that sends orders to the periphery, then the whole idea that there are different social structures become problematic between capitalism and non-capitalism. The idea of capitalism doesn't dictate any, any form of, and that's why Ken, uh, Duncan writes that Marx was wrong, that he thought that from the fact that we're living in a capitalist system, ergo sum, ta -ta 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 -ta, these kind of things should uh, be uh, deduced automatically from the system. Now, this is very important because if you don't know the structure of the structure, means you don't know how to change the structure and where's the heart of the structure. And if you have to capture the, uh, the winter palace or the Bastilla or where to hit the system in order to move from one structure to structure. And this is renders the difference between reform, reform and and revolution, actually, problematic because both of them are matter of degrees, not matter of equality. That's why, ergo sum, Duncan says, okay, why to suggest a reconstructive project? 
the project of reconstructions. When I have five minutes, you will. Yeah. Now I have five minutes. In one minute, you'll have five minutes. Ah, okay. <laughs> The project of reconstruction looks from a left MPM point of view, like the verification of fetishism of theory, in a mode parallel to the fetishism of God, the market, class, law, and rights. Left MPM, by contrast, is caught up for better or worse in the viral progress of critique. But I hasten to add once again that losing faith in theory doesn't mean living up uh, doing theory. A and here probably s some of the heat um, in my... Uh, or some of my passion in, 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 the, in this process, both as a, uh, someone that at least once was a leftist, and um, as we do in the academia, we do sometimes intellectual uh, work. Now, is this openness in theory is the death of the political or its condition? And I ask this question because here is, here is the, here's the, here's the predicament. Too much structure there is no need for politics because we are almost, if we do the extension, we are living in natural necessity. And with natural necessity, you don't do politics. But if there is no structure at all, you don't do politics either because whatever you do, you don't have any sense of causality that you can determine the course of action in the universe. So too much structure is bad, but too little structure is bad either. Now. The fact that there are too many openings in the system has its good aspects and its bad aspects. Now, the typology of structure and action, and this is the sort of the map that I want to put and then to ask uh, ourselves where to locate Duncan uh, Kennedy. I mean, one version of structure is sort of, there's a structure, it's hidden, the structure. It could be provided. Uh, Providence, it could be the cunning of reason. History has its own tellers. This is sort of some Hegelian story. In this story, uh, there's not much place for the actor to do. There is structure. This is one. Two, there's a structure, but there is an openness in the structure that the role of the agent is sort of where the structure is broken, the agent can interfere and help sort of the um, the train of history be on its track or to hasten history, this is sort of some version of, of Marx. I mean, Marx is Hegel, but when with opening, that is the proletariat has to do certain phase in history and then bring structure again. This is scientific utopia. This is clearly not Duncan Kennedy. Now, no structure at all. It's, the history is sort of accumulation of catastrophes. I don't think... This is Duncan Kennedy either. Now, no structure and no, no structure. It's, it's no structure, but there is no, no full um, uh, knowledge that there is no structure. Then the fact that there is, we, there is structure or not, we are sort of ignorant about that. And that sort of allows us to have some hope. One version of that would be Kant philosophy of history. Fifth version um, is sort of unfounded hope, like people like Rorty, or some version of celebrating the impossibility of hope, like some deconstructionists who thinks that we need hope when it's absolutely seem hopeless. And this is deconstruction in this sense brings us somehow to Christian uh, Paul, uh, a sense of uh, hope. And then we can just move to the absurd, sort of like uh, Albert Camus, that there's unbridgeable gap between our action and the irrationality of the universe, and there's nothing to do about it. All what we can do is just celebrate the act in itself. If we don't change the world, probably we can change ourselves. And here's the intensity of the action itself. Now, I'm not going to look at uh, Duncan. He should do his on work. But what I would do is push Duncan in two senses. One is to do the old trick since Kant and which is deduction. Deduction is not to ask Duncan sort of uh, <laughs> your theory is Duncan assumes that we do action, we try to influence, etc., etc. And given the action is given, then what image of universe 
one can suppose in order not to commit a practical paradox. Practical paradox by that I mean that if I act in the universe, I assume that the action get me closer to my goal. Then I need sort of some metaphysical idea about what the structure of the universe that I'm working with. And since he thinks that he wants to act and he preaches for acting, then we need uh, such a theory. Second, and here I think um, Duncan owes us something. Uh, Duncan, on both sides, I mean, you did a marvelous job not writing poetry like Dostoevsky in order to tell us that reason, we can get away with reason. You used reason in the fight of reason. So you have reason on both sides, on both sides. To do critique, you need reason. And by sort of uh, um, critiquing reason, you're vindicating reason at the same time. So you have reason on both sides. I want to finish with the 15 seconds with the questions w that I asked while you were on the panel, and this is the fear of winning, and whether Duncan is bringing back the pre-sort of Hegelian Marxist tradition that Kant was all the time weary that some of us would appropriate the Promethean uh, ideal of reason and to extend it beyond its limit. Um, sort of, and Kant was in this sense very, very, very cautious, and he didn't do the mistakes that uh, Marx, uh, Hegel, and Marx did. And in this sense, Kant is, is is sort of reviving this tradition. But here, I want to suggest just one, uh, no, 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 one, one answer that Hegel suggested to Kant when he was obsessed with the idea of the tool, reason before. And he said, sometimes the fear of making mistakes can be the fear of truth itself. You can't learn to swim until you jump into the water. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move on to Dr. Dina Wakid, who joins us from Sciences Po in Paris. And her broad tackle, I don't know if she has a subtitle yet, is Critical Legal Studies and Development Studies. Great. First, uh, I'd like to thank you and thank Nimmer for inviting me to be here. It's a great pleasure, and I thank all the organizers and the discussions for what is to come. Um, I've chosen uh, to talk to you today about two critiques uh, within uh, CLS of law and economics um, that have very important extensions uh, to development studies. Before I do so, I want to tell you why. So maybe my subtitle would be Development Studies, uh, Studied Through a Critique of Law and Economics. Um, the, the reason I choose to talk about the critique of law and economics and uh, drawing these extensions to developing uh, development studies um, is firstly because I think uh, that it's extremely central to development studies to understand uh, the language and uh, the, the analytics that are uh, proposed within the movement of law and economics, especially the kind of development that we're talking about today in most of the global south, uh, post the Washington consensus, as part of a lot of treaty and loan conditionality um, and general arrangements um, that uh, have been promoted by international financial institutions that dictate how these development programs are to be run by uh, the southern developing countries. So the language of law and economics uh, provides important analytics to be able to discuss these development programs uh, where economics and the role of the economists become extremely important and dominate a lot of the policy making framework uh, that is being uh, presented, uh, often at the exclusion of the jurists. Secondly, um, I'll try to draw on a little bit of the work that I've been interested in doing for the past couple of years. I've been working on a project trying to uh, use the tools available within law and economics um, to challenge some of its own mainstream assumptions um, while still using its language and its tools. So I use a lot of data and I lose a lot of data estimation techniques and econometrics and I'm trying to benefit a little bit from the pretensions of the scientific neutrality or objectivity of law and economics and trying to place uh, myself as a critic within the movement himself, itself, but trying to benefit of uh, the fact that a lot of uh, the arguments, or at least the language 
that is being proposed has this guise of scientific methodology. Um, and while doing that, being able to address issues that I think are better addressed, or at least will be better received if addressed from the camp of law and economics, even if only to resurrect some heterodox ideas about development that challenge some of these static goals, especially related to the normative project of law and economics. So I do that with the hope um, that maybe a space of resistance from within law and economics can be uh, emerged. Um, and therefore, I will focus today and, um, on, on two critiques uh, uh, that I think are particularly important. Uh, and uh, I heavily borrow in what I'll be talking today from uh, the work of Duncan Kennedy to draw on uh, these extensions of that critique to development studies. So the first critique is about efficiency, and the second critique is about redistribution. And in the next couple of minutes, I'll try to show you uh, how uh, Duncan's work critiquing cost-benefit analysis and his work, as we heard a little bit about it in the morning, about uh, uh, landlord-tenant law, uh, uh, especially regarding the imposition of compulsory duties into these private law rules uh, to, achieve redistrib to achieve redistribution of wealth and income, can uh, allow us to be able to present a more nuanced critique uh, relevant to development studies but also, at the same time, offer a constructive project or proposal for development in the South. And uh, I'd, I'd like to highlight that towards the end of my, uh, my presentation. Um, so um, these critiques uh, have been integrated uh, into heterodox uh, development studies. And uh, as I uh, introduced earlier, I'll, uh, at, at, at the end of each critique, I'll try to present some uh, results of my own work on market structure, competition, and industrial policy in the South. So starting with the critique on efficiency, uh, what I mean or what is meant uh, by law and economics refers to the body of literature that is taught in the tradition uh, that proposes and elaborates cost-benefit analysis as a way for policymakers to be able to uh, recommend rules to judges, legislators, and administrators. And mainstream uh, law and economics proposes that courts uh, make these decisions or uh, make, private, make market defining private law rules according to the Calder-Hicks uh, definition of efficiency. Uh, leaving all distributional question to the legislative and active tax and transfer. So there is an active uh, or, or, or a very obvious uh, neglect of all distrib distributional questions, despite the fact that all of these rules have distributional elements. Uh, so the efficiency talk starts from uh, accepting the absolute uh, rights of property and freedom of contract, and when it comes to markets, which is the part that I'm particularly interested in, looks at, uh, or at least mainstream law and economics, says that the free market system is the efficient system um, to uh, lead to the best outcomes, and this is only possible under perfect competition. So perfect competition plays a central role in the analysis of achieving uh, any uh, efficiency. And uh, any market failure is then treated through specific regulations that are aimed at restoring perfect competition, which in turn will then bring about all of these uh, great efficiency outcomes that are uh, projected. This methodology uh, is presumed to be uncontroversial due to the very simple premise that we are supporting a legal change uh, in the legal regime that helps those who gain uh, buy it more than it hurts those who lose. So it appears to utilize this objective scientific methodology uh, that claims that it's apolitical, it is coherent, and it's free of value judgment. You just see if the winners make more than the losers, and if it's so, then this is a good rule, and so be it. However, uh, Duncan's work uh, on his critique on cost-benefit analysis shows very clearly that none of this is true. Uh, it is indeterminate, controversial, political, and has a bogus air of neutrality and objectivity, given a long list of political decisions uh, or choices that the application of this methodology entails, but everyone seems to ignore and then jumps to the conclusion that it's neutral and apolitical. Uh, I won't go through all of the critiques, but one of the important ones is that ignoring the initial set of endowments, uh, both factor and entitlements, uh, favors the sta status quo, often rich friendly rules, and allows the law enforced to become the baseline of analysis. So knowing about these empty prom promises of efficiency, I think is extremely liberating in the sense that it gives way to an equally politically motivated alternative uh, that can guide development studies and that can allow them to break away from the neoliberal uh, or mainstream law and economic prescriptions of following the perfect market competition, allocative efficiency, 
proposals. And I think this is vital to the extensions of developing studies, especially uh, that uh, countries uh, in the South have subscribed to that mainstream neoliberal approach, uh, following the started goals of allocative efficiency, um, promising to achieve that or, or, or being promised to get at these efficiencies through perfect competition and free trade. But as uh, we all know, and uh, as has been uh, obviously uh, shown and, and, uh, and presented over and over is that developing countries have only plunged into more poverty, inequality, dependency, and debt. All these proposals for trickle-down economics have failed. The entrenched local elite and the multinational have captured most of the surplus. And despite the fact that there is no holistic development policy available to show what the alternative is, those countries that have taken off have shown to have followed policies where efficiency did not play a central role in their analysis. Uh, these alternative goals um, are extremely wide. Some of them have focused on industrial policy, uh, fostering national uh, com uh, champions, promoting expert cartels, and only encouraging oligopolistic rivalry, but not perfect competition. So here the work, for example, of Alice Amsden and others show that these heterodox uh, growth theories, uh, or countries that have followed these heterodox uh, growth theory, have outperformed those that were stuck in this perfect competition deadlock. Working on market structures myself, what I've done is I've looked at 50 developing countries, uh, and I looked at uh, the relationship between their competitive structure and growth in the manufacturing industry since the 1960s. And I've collected data to, com to, to, sh to look at the relationship between uh, competition uh, or competitive market structure and uh, growth in the manufacturing industry. And I found that uh, um, most of these countries do not grow under the assumptions of perfect competition. So what actually happens is an inverted U relationship between competition and growth. So at initial levels, uh, encouraging some competition is essential for countries to grow, which might make a lot of, a lot of sense because what is happening at that point is that uh, a lot of the um, means of production that are um, uh, controlled by a few local elite are broken up and you create some basic rivalry. But then once uh, more competition is uh, introduced, then this leads to negative uh, outcomes and uh, doesn't necessarily allow the country to continue on the growth trajectory. So by showing that, I think it's a very, um, uh, very nice relationship to be drawn back to the critique of efficiency, namely that all that has been said about the benefits of efficiency and its centrality to development studies in terms of focusing on allocative efficiency uh, has actually been shown to not be the case when I collected actual data and did what they do. So I used the numbers, used the techniques that they would use, but proved that many of these mainstream assumptions are actually not true. Uh, the second uh, critique uh, that I wanted to talk about is, again, the mainstream law and economics uh, ignorance or, or um, ignorance of the redistribution of uh, wealth and income and social power through the modification of private law rules. Um, and they argue that this should be dealt with under the tax and transfer system instead. Uh, this prevents, in many instances, this reconfiguration of the ground rules of property and contract that define the free market. And here I want to draw on uh, Duncan's work on housing, where he shows uh, in his pieces uh, that selective enforcement of, for example, a warranty of habitability <laughs> as a duty factor into these lease contracts um, in certain specific market conditions, so a, an important market analysis needs to be undertaken, can actually achieve real distribution from the landlord to the tenant. So this depends, for example, on the market structure uh, in terms of how many competitors are on the firm. Are the landlords locked in with their investments? And the same can apply to firms. Are the firms locked in with their investments? So in that case, they will not be able to um, they will have to carry the increase of the cost of the duty themselves. They will not be able to translate that into higher prices. The same with markets that are extremely elastic. So when you have elastic demand, again, the, con the, the sellers or the landlords will be uh, uh, not able to increase the cost of whatever they're offering, uh, and they will have to bear the cost of the duty themselves. So these compulsory terms that can be factored into these kind of arrangements do have these effect of creating that real distribution. 
uh, that is arguably, uh, or I try to argue, also extremely important for the kind of development studies that I talked about earlier, namely that firms in the South, uh, especially, uh, or, or regardless of which option they, um, what, what kind of framework we look at, but firms in the South are in many instances concentrated, or the markets are concentrated. So they're either just concentrated because of uh, the earlier uh, ISI policies where um, you have few industries being dominated by few firms, or because of the neoliberal approach allowing privatization and then consolidation into the hands of a few local elites, and then mergers, foreign direct investment, and so on. But the story is that most of these countries do have concentrated firms uh, or concentrated markets, uh, and therefore, maybe if such a compulsory duty can be factored in these contractual arrangements, then some kind of redistribution can be achievable. And one idea would be, for example, to allow firms that have a certain uh, element of market dominance to be forced um, to, to fund something that can be called the consumer trust out of the rent that they're generating. And this rent can be then redistributed back to the consumers who end up by default paying higher prices every time they buy a product of the firm that is uh, selling under these uh, dominant market conditions. So in a way, they become stakeholders uh, into that trust, and they can benefit um, from um, being considered as stakeholders, so not only to be compensated for any losses that they sustained, but they can also uh, be thought of as um, as being able to receive more than just the compensation for their losses, which is similar, again, to, I draw the uh, similarity here with Duncan's work of setting up this consumer uh, community land trust uh, that will allow, for example, the surplus extracted from the development forces to <coughs> residents in, uh, and then redistribute that to residents in the form of limited equity residential tenure or uh, infrastructure development in impoverished neighborhoods. So these distributive objectives are achievable through these change of background rules that organize these kinds of relationship. And I chose to, to highlight these two uh, critiques, uh, CLS critiques of law and economics, um, that I think are extremely empowering. And uh, by offering this conceptual vocabulary, uh, by talking concretely or more technically uh, about development studies that aims at achieving other things than, it, than efficiency, so other predetermined social goals, for example, that in, a, in and of themselves are, are, are as politically driven as the efficiency criteria that just pretends to be apolitical. And I just want to end by saying that using the language of law and economic can be in and of itself a strategic move to find the space within law and economics uh, to expose the limitations and the flaws of that movement, um, to challenge the principal foundations, and uh, to the benefit of alternative policies that can benefit, for example, from legal left studies such as the work that uh, Duncan Kennedy has been writing about. Thank you very much. very much to all and thank you all for being so courteous and sticking to the time um, which was wonderful um, we now have a comment from our discussant dr. Brenna Banda from our very own School of Law at SOAS um, please okay thanks I'm going to sit here because I have this mess of notes um, because I was trying to listen as much as I could because I hadn't seen the, the papers in advance and saw some uh, sort of short um, abstracts, but I first want to thank you for such a, a rich uh, collection of reflections on Duncan's work. Um, so what I did instead, uh, um, in addition to taking copious notes of right now, uh, was to think about sort of three questions that came out of rereading some of Duncan's work um, in the last little while, and I think that I've been able to uh, sort of configure them to address the papers that, uh, that you just delivered. Um, now, the first question that I have, and I think this is mainly directed at Joanne, uh, but of course, if any of the other panelists would like to answer, that would be great, or indeed Duncan himself, um, is about the, the extent to which um, the, um, what Duncan outlines in the Freedom and Constraint and Adjudication essay in particular, which Joanne spoke to, um, changes the orientation of law or whether uh, the kind of legal reasoning that he outlines um, critiques in, in the sense of an imminent critique and leads to a transformation 
of the legal form itself. So uh, are, we, are we looking at, um, you know, in, in terms of the redrawing of the boundaries, for instance, between speech and property, which Duncan uh, uh, writes about in that piece, or with Joanne, uh, when she talks about the redrawing of the boundaries between in tort law and uh, between what is considered settled and unsettled, uh, my question is, does this change uh, the, the legal form in a, in a foundational and more structural sense, or does this reorient the law in a way that's less structural? And, and my question, I, I'll say, comes out of um, a concern, and, and not a concern, an interest in theories of the legal form itself. And in the first panel, there was discussion of post-Marxists who are not anti-Marxists. And uh, I wanted to mention that there are a, an increasingly, well, there's a small but growing number of uh, legal theorists who uh, are actually um, taking up uh, Marxist theories of law, particularly through the work of Pashukhanis. But I think, uh, and this is something that was absent in the discussion, I think, in the first panel, is, is the work that actually takes Marxist thought and reads it through uh, a black radical tradition to um, think about how issues of race and indeed gender and sexuality uh, need to be brought into Marxist critiques of the legal form. And so uh, that's where my own uh, interest in, in this question of the legal form comes from. So to put it more specifically to Joanne, um, when Justice Green uh, redraws these boundaries, does he merely, or not merely, of course, it's, a, it's an extremely important judgment from the sounds of it, um, but does, is he you know, increasing the scope for finding police, uh, the police um, liable for negligence, or is he actually uh, setting out a template for addressing police power and police violence? Uh, that's how I would see the difference between the changing orientation and the more, more foundational critique of legal form. Um, okay, the second um, thing that I was really struck by in looking at um, Duncan's work recently is the role of emotions in law. And, uh, you know, I was really struck in all of this writing about how, in your writing, since you're there, about how much emotional language is, is runs through your work. And I thought in many ways this really, um, you know, is, is, is very prescient when we think about a lot of the feminist uh, and, and also queer theory that comes comes afterwards where with a, with a very uh, uh, strong focus on affect and emotion. Um, and I wanted to ask Raif um, about, uh, where, about where the role of emotion or affect is in the questions you wanted to raise to Duncan and perhaps if you could, uh, you know, maybe you want to reflect on your own work, but I, I noticed that you mentioned words like passion, fear, obsession, uh, and hope. As, as really sort of key orienting concepts in, in the talk that you gave. So rather than asking you a, question, a more question about the sort of very broad philosophical canvas which you uh, painted, I, I wanted to ask you to reflect on, um, on the role of emotions. Uh, and then um, turning to Dina's uh, talk, I wanted to, uh, one question I have about Duncan's work is where is the place of history? Um, so in, in trying to understand the mode of legal reasoning and thought that Duncan uh, um, navigates us through, uh, what is, in, in the first place, the history of the modes of thought that you are um, introducing us to, walking us through, and playing with? Um, where is your idea of consciousness and perception, which in the freedom and, and constraint and adjudication piece, at some point seem very relational, so make me think of a Hegelian tradition, and other times seem quite individual, almost Lockean or Cartesian and in perception. So I, I wanted to ask this question, maybe, maybe this is just a question for you and not the panel, <laughs> but the question about the place of history uh, comes back to the question of how, how we understand social formations. And in Dina's talk, I wanted to ask a specific question about the first critique that you um, draw out about the critique of efficiency. Now, I know virtually nothing about law and economics. I have to admit that. But, so I was thinking, uh, how do I relate what you're talking to to something that I, I do know a little bit about? So I thought, uh, I wanted to ask you how the critique of efficiency and the cost-benefit uh, analysis relates to um, 
you know, more historical critiques of the place of measurement and improvement in colonial history and the colonial history that must, I think, prefigure your own work on, um, uh, on uh, the critiques of development that I, I, I shouldn't presume, but that's what I heard, uh, that I imagine that there's a, a, a critique of colonialism and colonial history that prefigures the law and development literature. Um, so I wanted to ask about the, yeah, about that, about the place of history. And then the last, uh, more specific point I wanted to ask about in, in terms of the second critique that you made, and I'll end with this, is um, I wanted to ask in terms of the, this idea of firms that have a lot of power creating a consumer trust for stakeholders and share, shareholders, I wanted to ask if, uh, if this is, is different or similar to the idea of very progressive taxation as a way of redistributing wealth. And it made me think of this, you know, new book that's out, which is getting so much attention. Piketty's book, Piketty's book on uh, on capital, where you know he infamously has not read Marx and all of this. Um, now, in his book, there is a an interesting statistic that I was really shocked by, uh, and I have to say that I've been reading reviews of the book, but I haven't tackled it myself yet. But I will. But um, but the, the the reviews of the book have pointed out that he finds that in the U.S over a fairly long period of time, the highest taxation rate has hovered around 80%, which is you know, phenomenal, because I always think of the US as a place that has a extremely low rate, that's what we're always told, right, that the rich are not taxed enough in the US. Uh, but the point that what this shows is that even progressive rates of taxation have not really made a dent into the degree of capital accumulation by the elite. And I think he also has some astonishing figures on the median income of the parents of kids who go to Harvard and things like that. Um, so, yeah. So I just I just wanted to ask that more specific question, but I'll leave my my comments there. Thank you very much, Brenna. I propose, and I'm chair, so what I propose goes at the moment. <laughs> I suppose. Sorry, that's norm making, rule making as we stand. I thought uh, you could all perhaps respond to the particular questions, and I thought after that. As we keep talking about you, Duncan, perhaps you might like to, if you felt like chipping in at the end after this round, we'll invite you in. If not, I'm sorry, it might cut everybody else out. So we only have to have past five. But we could talk very quickly. So, um, <laughs> Joanne, you had a question. Is that, that seems to work? Discussion like first? No, no, this is fine. Question is, Joanne, from Brenner to do with the critique of legal form. Yeah, yeah, this is not a question I could answer quickly, Brenner, although it is an interesting question. Um, briefly, or as briefly as I can, I understand the current form of law to be contingent and historically generated. I tend to be attracted to the Weberian account of the rise of this particular form of law in, in the context of capitalism, and therefore it's eminently changeable. There's nothing foundational about it. Within that context, though, I also find Foucault's account of um, discourse uh, very helpful in uh, understanding how you can work law as a form which is historically contingent uh, uh, in order to mould it into the ways that the outcomes that you want. And um, I think, so I don't think I'm doing anything particularly transformative at all. And I, I, I think that one of the interesting things about Duncan's uh, account of uh, left al phenomenological alternative is precisely that it is phenomenological and uh, when he's talking about uh, and also freedom and, uh, uh, and a um, constraint is similarly so. When he's talking about how you might use the legal materials to get the answer you want to come out, it is, he is actually talking about his experience of working the legal materials and I find that terribly familiar and resonant, not an alien account, but one that, that actually speaks to the way in which I, I... So I think the difference between the critical legal studies account of law and the traditional account of law in terms of black letter law, uh, doctrine, um, that there is far less uh, of a gap between them than you realise. It's just that in one context, you're looking at law as a sort of grid uh, a set of rules and you, you sort of move things, a kind of two-dimensional thing. And in the other context, which is Duncan's, you're talking about law as a moving dynamic, um, uh, something that you do 
rather than something that is. And I think that's closer to the experience of the practicing lawyer, probably, than the kind of um, rather uh, ossified law that grew up in the 20th century Anglo-American Academy. Thank you. Right. Uh, I don't have much to say. I think the... So first, first, I didn't. Uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't think about this question very much. But the first thing that comes to my mind is, that I think, the the concept of strat of strategy, strategic um, working on the materials, it's already incorporated in it what uh, classical or traditional theory try to suppress, and that is that. That's what we do. This is what's happening. You, you, you approach the material with incentives, hopes, um, ideas, preferences, etc. And this is, this is what there is. So I think the idea of strategic approach to the materials incorporates um, in it the, the, this conception of passion, emotion, fear, um, uh, hope, uh, etc. I think this is this thrownness. You're just thrown into the situation and the, the idea of mastery that you're here, the material there, and you master it, uh, or that it's, it's out there, um, th th that's the only thing I can say about, about this question. I'm, I'm, I hope that adds something. Uh, thank you, Dina. Um, I think you had the world of history. <laughs> I think you have, I think it's it's uh, probably Duncan be able to speak better about that than I do. But I, I think I, I will I will respond to the point that you were making in reference to uh, how this relates to colonial history. And I think what is I think what can be emphasized here is that most most of that efficiency language mm -hmm. has been superimposed on many of these countries through all of the <coughs> trade agreements and conditionality <coughs> in loan and international financial institutions role to play in these development programs. So in that sense, it is not something that these uh, that countries in the south and developing countries uh, have chosen on their own uh, to guide their development policies. So in a way, that would be probably, if critiquing that, in a way, could also transcend into a critique of colonialism in the sense of the power relationships and also a, a class relationship because at the end of the day those who buy that rhetoric inside these countries are usually the elite in force happy with that kind of rhetoric and what that would, would lead to exaggerated surplus and rent that they will be able to acquire and not be forced to redistribute it, believing in the whole trickle-down economics everyone was happy with, with, uh, with the showing of growth numbers, not caring about what this does to poverty and, and further debt. Um, so maybe it's not a direct answer to your question, but that would be uh, a little bit of my thoughts on that. As to your second point, I think it is exactly not exactly what I I was trying to to illustrate that this is not the proposal of progressive taxation. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you you create a change in the rules themselves that that will n no longer require progressive taxation to deal with redistribution. So in a sense that you have this for example, selective enforcement <coughs> against the firms that, uh, for example, are raising their prices locally, but are exporting most of their products. Okay. So um, somehow you pick that selective enforcement okay. for the money to be in reinvested in that trust and to directly benefit those who buy. So there is this very direct relationship that in a way might work out. So I, I don't know how you, you would think about it, but I've been thinking about maybe it could work out that everyone who buys a product from a firm that is being uh, protected in a sense of a dominant market position would be known uh, by receiving a coupon or something. And the coupon can be cashed in at a certain point of time with the difference between the price paid and the but for price, for example. And as long as they're holding that coupon, they're considered stakeholders in the financial performance of the firm, for example. So this is forced redistribution that the progressive taxation then does not yeah. necessarily get, generate. Thank you. Right, we have actually. Thank you for being so swift. We do. We're going to have a bit more time. So, um, how much time? Well, <laughs> wait till half past half past five. <coughs> Not we? Till half past five. So we have twenty minutes. So, I'm wondering whether we should take a cup. Do people have a couple of questions also? And perhaps we could call on you then towards the end. Is that okay? Yes. Yes, sir. 
Thanks very much. Uh, Ewan McGahey from the London School of Economics. Um, Dina, I just wanted to ask you a question because there's this really interesting idea or the, the, the critique that you were making of the law and economics movement. They, uh, they, they ran away with this notion that you can segregate distribution questions and efficiency questions. And I, and I think it was a young man called Ronald Coase who once did a course called Commercial Law at the LSE who went over to the University of Chicago and got them all on board with this idea that you could um, separate the two. Um, I, I was just wondering what you thought about uh, a sort of newer idea that's been coming along, which is that fairness uh, questions do actually matter for efficiency. There are efficiency consequences for inequality. Um, now, you, you see that writ large with Piketty's book, um, uh, which I suppose is all on our reading list now. Um, and uh, you can also see it in micro uh, experiments. I mean, if people are treated unfairly at work, if there's big disparities in pay when people do the same job, but uh, we, we can show experimentally, empirically, that it has efficiency consequences. And I think that's something that's really uh, undermines the uh, um, law and economics argument. I wouldn't agree more. So, so, so. But, but I think what, what I what I was also trying to highlight is that efficiency in a, in and of itself can be totally replaced, and that's the thing. So we do not need to organize anything with efficiency as the ultimate goal. And I think that's the le legacy of the mainstream law economics that they've convinced everyone that everything, even if we interject concepts of fairness, we're only talking about fairness as to how much this will promote efficiency. But that isn't the, the thing at all, because efficiency in and of itself is a political choice, and so could fairness be. So we just say we want to organize the market so that it's fair. We want to organize the market so that we promote something totally different other than any of these concepts. More questions. I see a number of my uh, 12 students here. Uh, if they don't, nobody else puts their hands up. I'm going to call on them to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher. <laughs> Come along. We're going to run out of time soon. Yes, Paul. Hello. You're next, Chris. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> Paul O'Connell from, from SOAS also. Um, Dean, as well, I found the presentation really interesting. And, and, and the question raised behind me. But the question is efficiency of what? You know, so, so the whole point about law and economics, I, I often wonder if they believe their own rhetoric. You know, the, the triumph of law and economics wasn't because the ideas, particularly in the legal, the, sort of, the, the, the triumph of law and economics in the US, wasn't because the ideas were so much sharper, so much more persuasive than what the left had to offer. They were just better funded. Uh, Duncan hinted at this when he talked about the conservative bar crushing the CLS movement. I've forgotten the guy's name now, but a former weapons oh. manufacturer and chemical, not chemical weapons, chemicals and weapons separately. Oh. Uh, all the, the Allen Foundation pumped millions into promoting law economics. And so I wonder, so when you were giving your talk, it, it brought Audrey Lord to mind and the idea that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house and to what extent we could sort of use the language, which is a class weapon. You know, law and economics isn't... Like any set of ideas, it's not an abstract set of useful ideas. It's a class weapon. It's ideas that performed a very particular function in a very particular historical period. So the dangers and the pitfalls of trying to flip it, you know, or should we just entirely reject it? So I'll just ask that question. Anyone? Would you like to start that? So, so I think that's 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 an excellent point because uh, you definitely. There is a, um, a big debate of what, what efficiency are we talking about. So is it wealth maximization? Is it Calder Hicks, which is also wealth maximization? Is it Pareto, Hicks, uh, Pareto efficiency, uh, allocative efficiency, dynamic efficiency? So I think there is a lot of also uh, debates within law and economics as to what efficiency to use. But I think I'll say the same thing again, that I think that the important or what I was trying to work with is trying to use the language and the analytics of law and economics to critique it from within. So I do think that there is a space to work with these kind of things. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's also what I, what I found in, in Duncan's work, is that these concepts are, are analyzed, are dealt with, and maybe to, to offer that space, to offer something instead, or, or, or enough to show that uh, by creating that deconstructive project that there isn't much left there to work with, could also be the case. 
Okay, thank you. I'm going to, would you? Sure. Would you, would you be able to say a few words in response to these amazing papers this afternoon? So I'll just make a couple of very, I thought I'd respond to the comment, to, to the commentary. So the papers were fantastic. Uh, it's sort of embarrassing. I feel somewhat embarrassed. I don't want to just say, oh, that's... I am you on the spot. You are on the spot. It's quite yeah. I, so I love the papers. Um, the, 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 but I'm more interested in the questions. So here's the way I would answer the questions. Um, and maybe for a moment it would be interesting to heighten the contradictions within the critical camp. Um, so let me make a, a, just a couple of remarks about the, the, these comments. So I think in critical legal studies, there was a moment uh, in the late 70s when there was an internal discussion about Pashukanas, in which one of the, as the group constituted itself, <coughs> there were a bunch of people who, the post-Marxists were of many different strands. The dominant post-Marxists, of whom I am one, were early Marx people. We were into the essay on the Jewish question, mm -hmm. the Communist Manifesto, the Grundrisse, uh, and uh, the economic and philosophical manuscripts. So that was where we were coming from. There were other people who were really into Pashukanas, and that produced an argument. The Pashukanas people lost. Maybe that was an historic tragedy for critical legal studies. The Pashukanas position, as it appeared in CLS, was basically the idea that there's a law of the commodity, and the legal form is linked to the concept of the commodity. We thought that was nonsense. And we worked hard in direct combat with our comrades, all internal to the movement, over whether it made any sense, there was any intelligible way that the commodity, the and what we accused them of is just that Marx, in this respect, was warmed over Savigny, mm -hmm. that Marx's concept of the, of the law, of the, that Pashkanis' concept of the law of the commodity was basically to just say that a particular early 19th century, mid 19th century, and late 19th century European conception that law has an essence, and the essence is rights, and the rights reduced to property and contract, and that that, so Marx just took it over, whereas the whole history of legal <coughs> thought after 1870 was the history within legal thought of rejecting the legal model that Marx incorporated into his understanding of the commodity. So I wrote an article as part of this debate called The Role of Law in Economic Thought, Essays on the Fetishism of Commodities, where I tried to take on the part of Book One, Volume One of Capital that deals with the question of fetishism of commodities, because that's where Pashukanis got the whole thing, according to me. So you're referring to just a deep, fascinating debate, which you might find interesting, in which when I say we won, we won partly through power, because we were legal realist Americans, and the people arguing for Pasha Kemis were sociologists. And therefore, we just said, you've never been to law school, buddy. You have no idea what you're talking about. Commodity form, property contract. And they stayed in the movement, but it was just like a typical example of intra-left battle. Maybe we were wrong, and what's happening now is my new serious Marxist students, of whom I have three at Harvard Law School, are they're threatening to revive Pashukanas yeah. and also the idea of a Marx, of, of a Hegelian, of a Hegelized version of Marx mm -hmm. in which the true Marxist position is a materialist dialectic of liberation. Again, something we had a big battle about. But there's nothing, no reason why we can't have this again in every generation. We could even do it every five years. It's really <laughs> fun. I really, really like it. So that's my reaction to the first thing. Um, the history thing, so a lot of critical legal studies is about the history of legal thought and the forms of reasoning, and the question of colonial history is very central to the way, in general, CLS people have tried to understand abroad from the point of view of America, that is, anything west of Cambridge or east of Cambridge. So, um, but I think that another an interesting way to understand the product, the project, this is also responsive to your question. Um, is that the current form of neoliberalism, OK, let me again put it in provocative terms. I love neoclassical economics. I love it. Uh, I majored in economics. I've, oh, I love graphs. And I love trying to prove things plausibly with graphs. And I think that the problem, the reason why law and economics of a neoliberal reactionary variety won 
was only to a very limited extent because of the Olin Foundation. It's true that they poured, mil exactly as you said, millions of dollars into it, building it up as an explicitly right-wing way to attack the liberals, not us. They didn't give a shit about us, but the liberals. The liberals had a problem, which is many of their economic proposals and many of their foundational ideas look stupid to a person with a neoclassical economics background, and I'm one of those people. So it really was the case that they wanted to discuss landlord-tenant without discussing the question of whether the particular reform would hurt tenants. They believed in rights of tenants, or they believed because the form of the reform was to increase legal entitlements for tenants, it must therefore be good for tenants. So we, a basic defining another battle inside critical legal studies, this was a battle not between the post-Marxists and the, the orthodox, I'm an orthodox, it wasn't that, it was between the humanists and rights believers who hate law and economics because it is a loathsomely macho, unbelievably dumb, the, um, the passions behind law and economics are sinister and dark passions, and they're so gendered that basically any boy who identifies with girls says, I don't know any economics, but uh, blah, 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 blah. So again, a goal here was to deal with this gender dynamic, which is not just boys and girls, right? Because feminized boys, boys are all organized around the same spectrum. So there was an enormous, all good American 60s leftish of boys have deep feminine identifications, even if they're macho blowhards. They also are identified in some way on the other side. They hated economics, and they believed you cannot dismantle the master's tools with the mas master's house with the master's tools, and besides, we can't use those tools. <laughs> Therefore, they cannot dismantle the master. We can't use them. So a very big agenda here was to repel that, mm -hmm. to fight back against it in the same way as fighting back against the boyish and girlish loathing of technicality in law. The so basic idea of critical legal studies is to embrace technicality, embrace technicality of each of the possible critical disciplines and Neoclassical economics is as powerful or more powerful, to my mind, as a critical discipline as the Marxist tradition. Partly because I think the labor theory of value has been a catastrophe for the left, although I know that a very large number of people who I respect and have worked with and like very much really disagree with that. So that would be the kind of, these are debates that are the debates inside critical legal studies. For the passion thing, I'm glad you asked. I thought Raf's answer to that was pathetic, <laughs> given the talk that he gave. <laughs> and I think you should just go back and say, Raf, could I ask you the same question again? Because I, <laughs> I do think that in my work, that it, you're absolutely correct in what you said about my work, but also about his work. Mm. So he doesn't even ever you know, breathe a long breath without putting together this the passion, reason, uh, the reason, non-reason, passion, reason, non-passion, non-reason. Um, oh, I said you're the person. <laughs>